First, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. And hello, everyone. Welcome back to Fox 12 Now. There is a look at Portland. Some clouds over there, but you can see a little bit of sun. So, you know, there's hope there, but uh, we might be getting some more rain later. You can check all that, all that out at kptv.com. And hello, I am Greg Nibbler, and I appreciate you all joining us. We are live here. There we go. Uh, live streaming on our website, on our apps, and of course on social media, on Facebook, and on YouTube. And we get to, uh, if you watch this show, have great conversations. Right now we're talking about the history of Portland Fire and Rescue, and so much more. There's really a lot to talk about, not only the history going back to, I believe, it's 1853, but then also some movements right now to uh, create a new memorial for fallen firefighters, and talking about some veteran firefighters. Veterans Day is coming up, and so that was kind of the impetus of all of this to talk about it. But we've got, joining us right now, Don Porth. And Don, I'm going to fix something real quick here. And uh, Don is joining us to talk all about the history of Portland Fire and Rescue and so much more. Uh, Don, thank you very much for joining us. Well, Greg, thanks for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. That The stories are worth nothing if they can't be shared, that's for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, that's why I, I was really fascinated when you sent out um, a message, you know, talking about this, uh, talking about not only the, the society, which I really want to talk about, the, or the website, but also talking about these letters. And maybe just to start off, could you tell us about what you sent out here with these letters that you received or that you discovered um, for, for Portland Fire and, and Rescue? Yeah, back in uh, 1945 during I think it was more the tail end of World War II, but uh, quite a number of firefighters from the city of Portland, you know, Portland firefighters have been deployed to World War II. And I'd heard numbers over the years, as many as 50 percent had been had been deployed, uh, which is hard to believe that half of the workforce could be sent out that way. Uh, one of our retired firefighters, in fact, his dad was one of those that was deployed, somehow had in his possession seven of these newsletters. And these newsletters uh, were a coordinated effort by one uh, Portland firefighter named Henry Rich, who did not get deployed, but he worked very hard on his own time to try to keep those that were deployed connected to those that they worked with. Uh, fire department is about family. It's about being together. People work together. Work shifts are uh, 24 hours a day. In fact, back in those days, in the 40s, there were only two, two work shifts, one day on and one day off. Then you'd work again in the day off. So your work week was 72 hours that you spent with the people that you were housed in the station with. So these, these newsletters were just fantastically interesting. Some of it was a little mundane, but others, it was, it was real insight from, from uh, uh, these firefighters that had gone to war all over the world, uh, sharing what was happening with them it would come back, Henry Rich would gather these, he would create the newsletter, send one to every fire station, and then one to every member that was deployed. And uh, from what I can tell, it looks like 231 of 552 Portland firefighters were deployed to World War II. And that's 42% uh, that's of the workforce. Imagine 42% of, of all of the staff at, at KPTV being sent off, and you have to make do and continue to do the same job while they're all gone. Yeah, doing that with half of the people and let alone, you know, what, what happens here for anybody else at their jobs. I mean, this is fighting fires. It's not like fires stop because the war is going on, you know, right. and, and those guys had to, had to take care of all that. Meanwhile, their, their buddies are over, you know, fighting a war. Who knows if they're all going to come home or not? I mean, that's just got to be so stressful. But seeing those letters and just understanding that time, you know, especially with Veterans Day coming up, too, and really uh, understanding just some of the sacrifice that was made, as you mentioned, even... Even some of them are mundane things, you know, just talking about their their day to day stuff. That's still really interesting to see what yeah. was going on back then. Well, and it'd be a cool thing to map out the entire world and show where some of these folks are. There were folks in South America, the South Pacific, in Asia, a lot in Europe, of course, uh, naval, you know, all over the, the bodies of water all over the world. It was it was really something uh, just to see those things alone. Well, Don, you are a veteran of the Portland Fire and Rescue. I mean, you, you're you're retired, uh, but can you talk to us about you know your service and what it meant to you to be to be serving with all of these these other people that are out there fighting fighting fires with you? Like, what's that what's that camaraderie like? Well, it's it's very significant. Uh, you, you make you know you're in you're in situations that aren't just the normal setting, and every day is not the drama that you see on TV on Chicago Fire or. <laughs> 
you know, this fire show or the other. It isn't like that at all, but there are moments in time and they take on many different forms, uh, whether it's just an emotional trauma of the things you see, the physical trauma, the, the, the challenges of a, of a, a large scale event. Uh, you know, I've been asked, what's the worst fire you've ever been to? And I would say the one where somebody died. It's not about the magnitude of the fire. It's about the impact of it. So through those experiences and the, the amount of time you spend with your coworkers, it has a profound effect on your relationship to them and just how you view the job. I uh, first got into the fire service back in 1980 as a volunteer in Happy Valley, uh, just a uh, you know, suburb of Portland. And um, I got my first paid job at the uh, city of Salem where I worked for a year. And then I was hired in Portland in 1984 and served 27 years before I retired about 12 and a half years ago. So really for the past 43 years, since I retired, I've done a lot of this stuff with history and, and other things. I have a few side jobs that are related to the work that I did. And so, you know, really my involvement in the fire service has spanned the last 43 years. And uh, it's just a, it's just a major part of my life. Which is a tremendous amount of service. And I, I want to talk all about this site as well and, and some of the work that you do there. We're talking about the history, I guess, of the Portland Portland Fire and Rescue or the Portland Fire Department. I don't know what it was called actually when it, when it first started. I'm sure you do and can clarify that for us. But talking about just just Portland fire here in, in the in the city of Portland, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it 1853 that it goes all the way back to? Yeah, and actually you can argue that point as to when it actually started. Um, back, so the, the common perception of the early fire service is that it was driven by insurance companies and all this stuff. Well, that was a real East Coast phenomenon. Out here in Portland, it didn't really happen that way. In fact, the first agitations, as it was called, for a fire service was started by um, Thomas Dreyer, who was the editor of the Oregonian. But he believed that uh, a fire department was needed. And many business people did because if, they, if there was a major fire, it could wipe out entire towns. And then a business didn't have a business to do and they didn't have people to do business with. So it was in their best interest to have a fire service. Um, it was really around 1850 when they began talking about it and there was the city uh, assigned fire wardens and a fire commission. These things happened at different dates. But what I really hang my hat on is on August 2nd, 1853, the first fire company, Vigilance Hook and Ladder, went into service protecting the citizens of Portland on that day. And in my mind, that's when it starts. Now, if you look on the side of a Portland fire engine or the patch on a firefighter's uniform, it says 1883. Um, I will say, I, I will still lobby that that's incorrect uh, because in 1853, August 2nd, 1853, the volunteer, the Portland Volunteer Fire Department began serving Portland. And they served effectively until January 1st, 1883, when the Portland Paid Fire Department was established. So it was a lot of the same people, a lot of the same thing. They just, the city finally just came up with a budget to be able to pay for firefighters and horses. So between 1853 and 1883, there were no horses to pull the fire engines. They were human pulled vehicles. Wow. So it was a backbreaking job and it relied a lot on citizens to pitch in and help out. As Yeah, I can't imagine trying to pull something like that up a hill. That's just, doesn't seem like that's something that would be possible. Um, oh, it looks like we might have froze there on Zoom. So uh, we'll see if we can get Don back uh, on here. As well, in just but the second. Portland Paid Fire Department, well, not only up a hill, but the, yeah, it's, I think that's my internet connection. Once in a while, we'll glitch. That's so, okay. Sorry You're back that. right now. That, that's fine. So okay. yeah, pulling something like that up a hill. Well, and not just a hill. There were not paved streets in those days. Portland was a lot of dirt roads. And of course, today was a typical fall winter day so you can imagine the condition and these vehicles were you know a couple thousand pounds uh depending on the time period and the evolution of the of the steam driven fire apparatus or the hand pumped uh, so there were a lot of things like that and then the portland paid fire department was even a bit of a misnomer because fi the firefighter shift from 18 um 1883 until 1918 was every day you worked every day and you had 12 hours a week off to take, you know, to go home, to go to an appointment, go visit your family, 12 hours a week. Uh, but a big thing happened in 1908, the city blessed the firefighters with 24 hours a week off to have some time to themselves. <laughs> and then in 1918, a second shift was added, which meant that there was one crew on one day and a second crew on the next day. And then back and forth, they would swap and go through. In 1948, a third shift was added 
And that's kind of where things are today uh, with three, a three platoon system, as it's called. Uh, but in, the, in, oh, in those days, 1883 and, and, uh, and 1904, the paid fire department only had three paid people on a crew. Uh, the rest were volunteers or what we called extra men. And so they're, they kind of did that in an effort to uh, get their foot in the door for hopefully a paid job. In 1904, civil service was implemented and a full crew of five per apparatus was basically installed and it's remained much like that uh, through today. I can't imagine having a fire crew that doesn't have a day off and has 12 hours a week to themselves and then expecting them to go out and, f and fight a fire and try to rescue somebody or, or save a building. Um, for, for you, Don, I mean, you were obviously a wealth of knowledge of this. How do you do all your research to find out all of this information? Uh, well, you know, it's funny because I really don't consider myself a, a history buff. I sort of fell into it all. So back in, well, so I spent the better part of my career as a public educator doing community outreach and educating the public on various things. Did a lot of work with youth set fires and educating families and kids specifically. Um, Portland's a pretty big city. And even though we had a generous staff to do public education, it was still time consuming to, to load up what we needed to take for a presentation, drive to it, unload it, go in, do it such as a school get done, load it back, drive back, get ready for the next thing and get all over town. So I had for a long time this dream of an education destination. How do we bring people to us for education programs rather than try to go to them? And the idea of a safety learning center was born. And in 2003, the fire station, uh, a new fire station was built over on 39th, just south of Hawthorne, which vacated the station at 35th and Belmont. And the city did not have a good vision as to what to do with that. And they asked me if this would work for this crazy safety learning center idea. And I said, yeah, yeah you know, we don't have anything else. Um, you know, it was hard to get money without a building. It was hard to get a building without money. So this whole idea kind of drifted along for a while. So this seemed like a, a pretty good solution to keep that building in the inventory for Portland Fire and to push this idea forward. So we spent the next year kind of preparing it and did a soft, op soft opening in September of 2004 with exhibits and, and things that shared the history of Portland Fire. But at that point, we hired an exhibit design firm to build really high-end uh, exhibits and other things in order to, to really tell the story. And so the exhibit folks said, well, what's, what story should we tell? I said, well, I don't know, because I'm kind of all new to this. And they said, well, how about firefighters are heroes? And I said, how about not? <laughs> <laughs> really, how come? Well, that's not our card to play. We do yeah. a job. It's not, you know, it isn't heroic when you're doing the job you're trained to do. It may seem like it from the outside, but the real heroes are the people that step up and do what's, what's beyond what's expected on any given day. So if you, for example, Greg, you're walking down the street and, and you see somebody injured or in trouble and you go beyond the scope of your normal life to do something extraordinary, you're a hero. If I'm there with a crew of firefighters and all the equipment I need and I'm just doing what's expected of me as part of my job that I'm trained to do and equipped to do, there's nothing heroic about that. It's just doing the job. So I don't think that it's that firefighters need to hit anybody over the head with what we are to them. That can be decided very easily. But what the story really became was, why does the fire department exist? Why has it existed in Portland since 1853? Well, don't take this the wrong way, but it's because people are inherently unsafe. <laughs> and yep. every call to 911, <laughs> every, every incident we respond to is, is kind of proof of that, of that idea. And so it, it's interesting because when you break it down that way, every piece of equipment, every tool, every you know, every ladder, every ax, every vehicle, everything is custom built for a life safety situation. And so they're all very interesting and unique pieces. And when you display those and share what they're about and how they were developed and how they're used, it really tells the story of, of the purpose of the fire department. And really the best example of that to me was a life net. You've seen the big life nets, you've seen the cartoons where people jump out of a building and they get caught mm -hmm. by firefighters. Well, those things are for real. Uh, they were rarely used because they were incredibly dangerous. It was very easy for somebody panicked and standing on a windowsill four stories up to completely miss. They could go across the street. It was even more difficult to get all firefighters surrounding it and hold it in a way that when a couple hundred pound person hit it, 
after a 40 foot fall, it didn't injure all of them. And so I had one of those on display and I actually made it look like a giant smoke alarm. And, and really the moral of that story is, and people would ask about it, and this was an open, an open door to begin to educate them as to why we don't use life nets anymore. It's because there are safety features built into buildings and things like smoke alarms working in your home will, will allow you the time to escape a building on fire without ever having to resort to jumping out a window into one of these things. And so just that one question about what is that or is that what a life net is would lead to a conversation where I could help people make their home and, uh, and their family safer. And that was what the facility was really all about. So we opened up with full exhibits in September of 2006. We added a couple other things through some grant money and other, other things. And, um, it really became quite a, you know, quite a place that was probably the best tool I ever had to use, had at my disposal as an educator. Well, and you have the, the website as well, where people can go and take a look at that. But, but before we mention that, I know uh, you wanted to talk as well about uh, the memorial for uh, the David Campbell Firefighter Memorial, which I know that we covered, unfortunately, uh, here on the station, we covered um, some incidents of vandalism at this memorial. But to give everybody the backstory on this, could you just tell us about, about this? And I pulled some of these pictures that you grabbed. Yeah, and, and again, it's... Um... Through my work with the Safety Learning Center, I had to come become somewhat of an expert on the, the history of Portland Fire. And when I did that, I I wrote a book actually, but the book, it was, you know, I would make new discoveries all the time, making the book almost obsolete. And that's why I went to the website and shared the different stories. And this particular story about David Campbell uh, is, is really one of the great, I guess, legends of, of Portland Fire. Uh, David Campbell was the fire chief from about 1895 to 1911. Um, political, <laughs> political things caused him to be removed from office for a period of time, uh, but, he, but a new mayor uh, then restored him to the chief's position. And David Campbell was very innovative, and he was also a very charismatic and likable guy in the community. Uh, very involved, very, um, uh, I don't know, just, just very well-liked. It's, it's hard to really quantify that. Uh, but the proof would come after his death. So on June 26, 1911, there was a fire down on uh, Southeast Water and Salmon Street, right down by the end of the Hawthorne Bridge. And it was a pretty significant fire. It was an oil, it was the Union Oil Company and had giant barrels of oil uh, that uh, caught fire and they were inside the building, they were outside the building. Uh, the biggest problem was they were in the city limits. That was kind of a thing that, uh, uh, that the fire itself proved wasn't a good idea. And uh, that fire, of course, was a big one. It created a big response. Chief Campbell was at home that morning. His driver took him down. He, he got there and he took command of the fire. And he could see the dangers involved and, and various things. And so uh, when it got to be really bad, he realized, hey, we got to get everybody out of there. Now, nowadays, we would just use our radio communications to contact anybody in the building or those crews that were, that were operating. Didn't have that in 1911. So he physically went inside the building to warn his crews out. And as they made it out, he turned to leave. And that's when there was an explosion that caused the roof to collapse, uh, killing David Campbell in the, in the building collapse. So within a couple of days, there was a real outcry from the community to do something in his honor. Uh, money was gathered and ideas of things. And it, would, uh, um, it, would, it was all about what do we do to honor him. His funeral procession was said to be the largest I had uh, have the largest attendance of any such event in the history of Portland, either before or after. It's estimated that 150,000 people lined the streets of Portland as his uh, uh, as his funeral procession went from the Portland Elks Lodge down, I think about Seventh and Stark, all the way up to Riverview Cemetery, winding through the city, and that's where he was laid to rest. So every year on June 26th, um, the Portland firefighters gather in remembrance of Chief David Campbell. Uh, but in the wake of his death, these donations, this sentiment and everything to do something in his honor took a couple of different forms. One was to create a fund for injured or ill firefighters to help care for them because there really wasn't a, you know, insurance and those kinds of things in those days. And the other was to build a physical memorial. Uh, in 1913, the David Campbell Memorial and Medal Fund was formed, which today is the David Campbell Memorial Association, which I'm the president of. 
uh, still exists and still caretakes the, the legacy and the memory of Chief David Campbell and the other fallen firefighters. But at the time David Campbell died, he was probably the fifth firefighter to die in the line of duty. Now it would take uh, 17 years to realize the, the uh, completion of this memorial, which is up between Southwest Alder, Southwest 19th and Southwest 18th, a couple blocks north of uh, Civic Stadium and the stadium up there. Most people are familiar with it, even though they don't necessarily notice it. And uh, that would be built in his honor. And every year uh, since we gather there on June 26th to honor him, we've had a couple of years when we haven't been able to because of uh, construction and you know various things. But uh, that's a tribute to him. And then they began to add uh, plates on the floor of it to honor other firefighters that had died in the line of duty. So by the time it was built, there were 19 uh, line of duty deaths. And so those nameplates were there. And then up till recently, there were 36, although it's way behind. And that's why we've been working on a project to build a more proper memorial to honor everyone, uh, not just David Campbell, because that memorial is really about him. But we need something better to honor the other firefighters. And that's yeah, when we came to the vandalism issue. Yeah, and unfortunately, and we, we've got reports on this, people can look up, uh, jerks are gonna be jerks, and um, to put it lightly, and some vandalism that happened there at the memorial, which is really unfortunate uh, that that happened. And, um, and yeah, like, you know, we don't have to go too far into that other than don't do that, people. Um, but what I, I, what I would really like to talk about is the uh, this right here, and I believe this is the rendering um, that would honor, uh, you know, all all of these fallen firefighters. If I'm if I'm correct, can you explain this? Yeah, you are correct. So this is the so we've been working on this for a couple of years now. So the the vandalism is is never good, but the timing of it, um, you know, the the timing of it, I guess, helps us bring attention to where we're moving on this. And we've recently released our renderings here, and and so what you're looking at to the right hand side. Uh, is the existing David Campbell Memorial. You can see the two lanterns on the, on the sides of the flank the steps there. You can see the plaza and then the fountain is, uh, is you know, to the left of it there. Uh, and that all exists as it is today. One of the problems with that portion is it's never been ADA accessible. You know, there's, you just can't really get up there easy if you have any kind of mobility issues. And that's something we have an opportunity to fix through a few design things. Uh, the part on the left, which uh, right now is just all grass, that would be our Fallen Firefighter Memorial Plaza. And on that plaza, we want to raise it up to the same level as the David Campbell Memorial, so the two connect and work together. And it would have along the left side, along the 18th Street side, have, and just for reference, Burnside is just below out of the picture, the stadium is just above out of the picture. Um, and that's 18th and 19th, and then the, the one right in front of it by the bus stop at Southwest Alder. Uh, but we'd have memorial walls that could list all the names because today we have 76 uh, fallen firefighters that we honor as line of duty or service connected deaths. Uh, we have a you know a couple of things are really changing in the fire service. The leading cause of death in the fire service actually historically has been heart problems, heart failure, uh, but cancer is quickly overtaking that. There's uh, there's more chemicals, there's more things going on, and as safe as firefighters try to operate, uh, cancer is really becoming the bane of, of a firefighter's life in the fire service. And there's a lot of efforts taking place to try to mitigate that, and a lot of it is, is safety. In fact, the, the simple fact in Portland is the last firefighter death that occurred in the line of duty was in 1977 that occurred at an emergency scene. 1977, so that's 46 years, and that's a tremendous safety record. But in that time, 18 firefighters have died due to the job, and it's been heart disease, cancer, and some other health-related issues that uh, uh, have really become the, the life taker of, of working firefighters. Well, I know we need to wrap up here shortly, but I wanted to just get this information out, you know, because that's, that's really unfortunate that that's happening, and I think that for the memorial, can you tell us where you're at in, uh, as far as the design stage, how far out are we from actually having that memorial put into place? Yeah, design-wise, we are just about to go to city permitting. You know, believe it or not, even for a city heritage site, we have to go through all the permit process, which is fine. 
Uh, then we'll, once we get through all the design approvals and everything, we'll be able to move into construction. It could be that by this time next year, if things move along well, uh, we could have it done, uh, but we are still short on funding. We probably need in the neighborhood of another million dollars to complete this. Uh, so if you, you know, anybody out there is feeling particularly <laughs> generous towards Portland firefighters or wants to support a great heritage restoration project, um, we welcome your information or your 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 donations and your help. Uh, our our website is is www.davidcampbellmemorial.org org, and uh, all of our information and you can follow along with newsletters and images as we update them uh, on our design uh, can be found there. And also contact information. I'm happy to talk with anyone. Uh, about the project or ideas they might have to help us along. But really it was built on, it was the, the, the original memorial was not built by firefighters. It was built by the community and it, it is important. And I think that's the sentiment of the community. But I'm also proud to say that Portland firefighters donated the first $100,000 out of their pocket to the, to the funds we have that we're currently using to move the project forward. So it wasn't Portland firefighters waiting for a handout or waiting for somebody else to do this. They stepped right up to, to uh, create this, uh, uh, the impetus for this entire project to move it forward. It is important to the history and heritage of the family of, of, of the fire service and especially Portland fire. It is very important. And Don, I, I thank you very much for, for coming out and sharing this and all of the, the wealth of history and historical information that you have for, for everything that you've just talked about. And people can go to portlandfirehistory.com as well and, uh, and find out more about everything right there. There's a, there's a wealth of information on there as well. I've, I've just gone through a tiny amount of it uh, just over the, the last day or so. So there's a lot more that I'm going to be exploring on there and just learning about everything that you talked about and just how important it is. And at the end of the day, thank you very much for all of your years, your decades of service to the city of Portland and you know the other places you worked before that, Salem and, and elsewhere and uh, Happy Valley. So Don, thank you uh, very much for being here and, and thanks for all that you do. Yeah, Greg. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for featuring this and letting me share some of these stories. I'm happy to go through the website, pick out something. Things like fire stations, they're in every neighborhood, you know, fascinating things. There's all kinds of stuff, but uh, I'd be happy to uh, uh, to sit with you and do some more. So, Yeah, uh, I like but, that. Yeah, but I appreciate it. And uh, thanks again for having me on. And uh, thanks to all the viewers for tuning in. Yeah, thanks, Don. All right. And, uh, and thanks, uh, like Don said, to everybody who's tuning in, joining us wherever it is you're watching. Again, this is Fox 12 Now. We're live every weekday at 1 p.m. We're live streaming on social media, so Facebook and YouTube, on our websites and our apps. So download the Fox 12 Oregon app on your phone or uh, well, your phone, or, or you can also watch it on, if you're on Roku TV, Apple TV, Fire TV, lots of places. But uh, there's a Fox 12 Now tab right on there, so you can watch all of our segments and our shows. But I thank you for joining us today. We're going to sign off right now. If there's breaking news, we'll be back, of course. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.